Welcome to the Neutral Ground Podcast. I want to start this week with a section from a speech by the actor Charlie Chaplin from the 1940 film The Great Dictator. This is the speech that Chaplin gives at the end of the film. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone, if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world there is room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful. But we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass, and dictators die and the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. I'm not sure there is a better speech in any movie than the one that Chaplin delivers in The Great Dictator. These words reverberate through us today because they are for us today. They are from a modernist heart for a neo-modern audience. By the end of this episode... We will have a word to describe Chaplin's profound words that move so many people even to this day. Sublime. Chaplin lived through the horrors of modernism. He looked into the abyss and hated what he saw. He releases the film The Great Dictator in 1940 while Hitler is blitzkrieging the Netherlands. Thousands dead and dying. Think about that. In the midst of such great suffering and horror, here is Chaplin's film. Most of the film is a satirical look at Hitler. When people tried to stop Chaplin from making the film, he said, I was determined to go ahead, for Hitler must be laughed at. This movie, like Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find, resides somewhat in both modernism and postmodernism. The modernist part speaks to the need to reconsider humanity while taking into consideration industrial revolution and machinery. It's postmodern in that he is taking Hitler's dominant narrative and infusing skepticism and mockery into it. Again, there is a place for postmodern art and even rhetoric in the world in order to help disrupt tyrannical systems. Today, we need great speeches more than ever. In an age where we tweet, post, like, and use emojis, rhetoric that infuses within us a feeling that we are connected to something greater than ourselves will become paramount to our ability to come back to a collective humanity. What is it about great speeches that lights within us a fire, that touches us in a way that seems to speak to the soul of the human? To better understand this, we're going to need to look at a text from the first century AD, and an author that we sometimes refer to as Pseudo-Longinus. We call the author Pseudo-Longinus because the authorship of the piece in question entitled On the Sublime is still somewhat up in the air. Nonetheless, for the sake of clarity, we're just going to go old school and call him Longinus. So let's set up our scaffold here by defining the term sublime for our needs through the author's own words. 
Sublimity is a kind of eminence or excellence of discourse. It is the source of the distinction of the very greatest poets and prose writers, and the means by which they have given eternal life to their own fame. Let's unpack that a bit. First and foremost, it's an excellence in discourse. We are quick to assign greatness to people today. However, although it often makes people feel great to hear that what they're doing is great, the downside is that it prevents them, you know, the individual, from actually becoming excellent. I bet you thought I was going to say great. Critique, as difficult as it might be to hear, especially today when we seem so anxious, critique is the necessary component of moving from good to great, and from great to excellence. But there's another element to the sublime here, one that involves a kind of transcendence of the body, something that we've been talking about here in neo-modernism. Truly sublime language transcends the author's mortality and places them in a kind of realm of immortality because we continually read them or listen to these great works or great authors. Think of poets like Homer, John Milton, and great texts. So in order to become a sublime author, your language must be excellent and you must provide something that speaks to humanity beyond your own mortality. Now, we need to differentiate the sublime from just persuasive rhetoric. There are many excellent speeches that persuade us toward a specific thought or action. They serve a very specific purpose in that regard. However, persuasive success does not necessarily equate to the sublime. Longinus tells us that persuasion is on the whole something we can control, whereas amazement and wonder exert invincible power and force, and get the better of every hearer. Therefore, there needs to be a sense of awe or wonder in the words, something that attracts us on a level beyond just the language. It has to have an evocative power, let's say, that quite literally creates a feeling of of movement within us. We have very little control over what places us in awe. When that does happen, however, whether in a speech or moment in a movie, that is when we know that we are experiencing a sublime moment. Let's keep building our understanding here so that we know when we are enraptured in the sublime. Longinus establishes five sources of the sublime. Let's kind of list them first and then we'll break them down separately. The first and most important, according to Longinus, is the power to conceive great thoughts. The second is strong and inspired emotion. The third is figures of thought and figures of speech. The fourth is noble diction, choice of words and the use of metaphorical language. And the fifth is dignified and elevated word arrangement. Okay, so let's take a look at these and try to provide some examples with them so that we can hear how they function in the real world. The first source of the sublime is the power to conceive great thoughts. Few people are born with an innate greatness for thinking. I certainly don't count myself in that category. However, you can attain greatness in thinking through reading great thoughts. As Longinus states, we must, so far as possible, develop our minds in the direction of greatness and make them always pregnant with noble thoughts. What does this mean for us, though? Well, it means that we need to curate what we consume to a degree. If you want to sit down every so often and watch something that is just, you know, just pure enjoyable entertainment, that's fine. However, understand that constantly consuming fluff might lead your mind to becoming fluff. If you want to achieve greatness in thought, you must consume great thoughts. Let's get an example of a great thought here. So when people think of the American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson, they tend to think of his essays, his, you know, often published works. However, there are amazing pieces of of ideas and writing in his journals. Here is one thought from his journal dated July 30th, 1830. Immense significance of the precept, 
Know thyself. In view of this, how ridiculous is Alexander and Bonaparte wandering from one extreme of civilization to the other to conquer men, himself the while yet unconquered, unexplored, unknown to himself. Yet Europe and Asia are not so broad and deep, have nothing so splendid, so durable as the possessions of this empire. How ridiculous the gladiators on our republican arena, greedy of a little showy power over their fellow citizens, property and rights, and foregoing the scepter of spiritual might that belongs to the self-comprehender. He that knows himself must always be felt as the superior of him that does not. Let the last rule the globe, if he will. Think of how often we feel like we need to conquer someone else because we feel lost in ourselves. Perhaps a more down-to-earth, relatable idea would be how much easier it is to give advice than to take our own. These are the kind of thoughts that create genuine introspection and give us new ways of thinking about and, and approaching our yearning that we tend to have sometimes to defeat others or even mock someone else. The question is, is the source of these thoughts a reflection of our own inability to conquer ourselves? Well, I'll let you think about that one a little bit. The second source of the sublime is strong, inspired emotion. I think we can say that the sublime is almost more of an experience than it is a lesson. Something that is sublime must move you. You must be in a state of awe. And awe is one of those words that seem to be not used as much as it should, or at least as much as we used to. The more we learn about how things work, the more we dissect them and find the people behind the curtain, the less it seems that we are able to produce awe within us. And awe is an important part of our existence and progress. Think of children for a moment. I heard the actor Rob Lowe mention on his podcast that he knew he wanted to be an actor at six years old because his parents brought him to see the play Oliver, and he was in awe of it. Think of the child who witnesses the rise and explosion of fireworks and is in awe so much that they enter a path of physics and chemistry. This does not simply apply to children, of course. Think of when you entered a cathedral and looked around at the works of humanity and were left feeling in awe of what we, as a species, have done and could do. Now, there is some science behind the phenomenon of, of awe. The following comes from a white paper entitled The Science of Awe, prepared for the John Templeton Foundation by the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley from September 2018. I'll provide a link in the episode notes to the actual white paper itself. I'm going to quote from the paper here because I couldn't put it any better than the paper does, honestly. So, in a landmark 2003 paper, psychologists Dasher Keltner and Jonathan Haidt presented a conceptual approach to awe. In this paper, Keltner and Haidt suggested that awe experiences can be characterized by two phenomena perceived vastness, and a need for accommodation. Perceived vastness can come from observing something literally physically large, the Grand Canyon, for example, or from a more theoretical, perceptual sense of vastness, such as being in the presence of someone with immense prestige or being presented with a complex idea like the theory of relativity. An experience evokes a need for accommodation, when it violates our normal understanding of the world. When a stimulus exceeds our expectations in some way, it can provoke an attempt to change the mental structures that we use to understand the world. This need for cognitive realignment is an essential part of the awe experience as conceptualized by Keltner and Haidt. Now, although Longinus says that the first source of the sublime is the most important I would simply say that awe might be the most important for us today. It's a way for us to transcend 
and view the world through a lens that is not so constrained by physical or even cognitive limitations. In fact, it requires a stretching of our cognitive boundaries. The third source of the sublime is the use of figures of thought and speech. Here is where we start to get more technical. When Longinus talks about figures of thought, he focuses on three specific tactics for engaging the listener and holding them in the sublime. First, amplification. Amplification is not, according to Longinus, simply adding grandeur to your speech. That was my best John Lovitz. What amplification means is to provide a comprehensive list of details and topics which constitute the situation. Think of your favorite documentaries. They're often the ones who provide the most detailed descriptions of not simply the main events, but of the sub-events that led to the main events. That is amplification. The second figure of thought is imitation. This means invoking greatness of thought and writing from the past to help make your point. Longinus says, When we are working on something which needs loftiness of expression and greatness of thought, it is a good idea to imagine how Homer would have said the same thing. We might feel today like this is almost fraudulent, right? Taking the easy way out through imitation. However, he's not saying that you write your whole idea in the voice of Homer. Rather, use Homer when Homer can say it best and did say it best. The last figure of thought is visualization, or fantasia. This is when your speech or language provides such an emotional connection that your audience can visualize what you're describing. This is not the same thing as when Sophia Petrillo from the Golden Girls would say, picture it, Sicily, 1938. I'm afraid that isn't fantasia, really, although it was always funny. The audience needs to be moved to create the picture. I think a good example of this can be found in James Earl Jones's speech from the movie Field of Dreams. As he's trying to convince Ray, the farmer and owner of the field, to not sell the farm to the bank, Jones's character, Terence Mann, uses Fantasia to move Ray to not sell. He says, Ray, people will come, Ray. They'll come to Iowa for reasons they can't even fathom. They'll turn up your driveway, not knowing for sure why they're doing it. They'll arrive at your door as innocent as children longing for the past. Of course we won't mind if you look around, you'll say. It's only $20 per person. They'll pass over the money without even thinking about it. For it is money they have and peace they lack. And they'll walk out to the bleachers and sit in shirt sleeves on a perfect afternoon. They'll find they have reserved seats somewhere along one of the baselines where they sat when they were children and cheered their heroes. And they'll watch the game, and it'll be as if they dipped themselves in magic waters. The memories will be so thick, they'll have to brush them away from their faces. People will come, Ray. The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. America has rolled by like an army of steamrollers, it has been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again. But baseball has marked the time. This field, this game, it's a part of our past, Ray. It reminds us of all that once was good, and it could be again. Oh, people will come, Ray. People will most definitely come. The speech is beautiful, and of course you cannot have it delivered by, you know, anyone other than the great James Earl Jones, with his tremendously melodic tone and perfect cadence. We see the field in our minds, and we can even see the people coming to the game, smiling and enjoying a moment in time when they don't have to consider the thumps of life. There is only a game to watch, and people to enjoy it with. There are quite a few figures of speech that Longinus discusses, but
But I want to just focus on one, hyperbation. This is when a speaker arranges words differently from that of normal use. For example, we might say the following sentence. My audience, I hope you find examples of the sublime in the works you consume. This is a pretty straightforward sentence with the address at the very beginning, my audience. However, do we get a different feeling or connection with the sentence if I move the words around a bit? I hope you find examples of the sublime in the works you consume, my audience. Is there a difference there? I think you might get a bit more sincerity and possibly a more intimate connection with the address being at the end, whereas the address at the beginning creates a more important and necessary connection, asking for your attention up front. You have to know how the arrangement of your language produces an emotional connection with your audience. That is hyperbation, and it can be a very undervalued and underutilized skill today. The fourth source of the sublime is noble diction. Word choice plays a pivotal role in maximizing the effectiveness of your message. There's a difference between saying, I am angry with the way we speak to each other today, and I am furious with the way we speak to each other today. There's much more force in the word furious, a palpable feeling of power or even potential energy that is waiting to become kinetic with that word. We can feel anger just about every day, but someone who feels fury every day is trapped in a perpetual state of energy that must be released, and likely with violence. I will sometimes have students who wish to elevate the language of their papers to the sublime, and so what they'll do is they'll kind of stop on a word in the middle of the sentence, and they'll right-click on it and check the the thesaurus and drop a $5 word in the middle of a 25 cent sentence, and it really rarely ever works out well. And that's because, of course, words carry connotations and emotions. You need to choose them as carefully as possible based upon how you want the audience to feel. Now, the final source of the sublime is dignified and elevated word arrangement. What Longinus means here is that there is a harmony to composition. You know, I'm often struck today when I read free verse poetry that does not seem to give much attention to the internal harmony of the verses. Yes, technically speaking, free verse does not have a strict meter. However, what that really means is that you actually have to work even harder to create a pleasing sound with your language. Let's consider the father of free verse himself, Walt Whitman. Here are the first three stanzas of the 1892 edition of Song of Myself. I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air. Born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. I, now thirty-seven years old in perfect health, begin, hoping to cease, not till death. There is movement here, actually. There is a kind of rhythm, a harmony, to what Whitman is writing here. It is sublime, especially when he says, For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. We could rearrange the composition of the, of the verse and lose all of its emotional connection. As Longinus states, Composition is a harmony of words, man's natural instrument, penetrating not only the ears but the very soul. It arouses all kinds of conceptions of words and thoughts and objects, beauty and melody, all things native and natural to mankind. We now have the five sources of Longinus's notion of the sublime. What that means is that you and I can go out and look for it, and you will know that you have experienced the sublime by the feeling in your soul, your sense of awe, at how it holds you in its grasp and will not let you go until you submit to it, to its language, its composition, its ability to make you see what the speaker wants you to see. 
I will leave you with a speech, one of my favorite speeches in all of literature, one that I've used in the classroom probably at least 50 times. It's from Homer's Iliad, a poem that Longinus would agree is sublime. And it's a speech given by noble Hector, prince of the city of Troy, to his wife Andromache. The context is important here, so let me kind of just quickly lay it out. The Greeks are attacking the city of Troy, and Hector is the greatest warrior of Troy. Still, his wife, Andromache, has a feeling that Hector will not live to see their son grow up if the prince goes out and fights. She begs her husband to stay within the walls of the city of Troy, and there is a tremendous amount of love in what she asks. This is how Hector responds to his wife's plea. All this weighs on my mind too, dear woman. But I would die of shame to face the men of Troy and the Trojan women trailing their long robes if I would shrink from battle now a coward. Nor does the spirit urge me on that way. I've learned it all too well. To stand up bravely, always to fight in the front ranks of Trojan soldiers, winning my father great glory, glory for myself. For in my heart and soul I also know this well, the day will come when sacred Troy must die, Priam must die, and all his people with him, Priam who hurls the strong ash spear. Even so, it is less the pain of the Trojans still to come that weighs me down, not even of Hecuba herself or King Priam, or the thought that my own brothers in all their numbers, all their gallant courage, may tumble in the dust, crushed by enemies, that is nothing, nothing beside your agony, when some brazen argive hails you off in tears, wrenching away your day of light and freedom. Then far off in the land of Argos you must live, laboring at a loom, at another woman's beck and call, fetching water at some spring, Masais or Hyperia, resisting it all the way, the rough yoke of necessity at your neck, and a man may say who sees you streaming tears, There is the wife of Hector, the bravest fighter they could field, those stallion-breaking Trojans. Long ago when the men fought for Troy. So he will say, and the fresh grief will swell your heart once more, widowed, robbed of the one man strong enough to fight off your day of slavery. No! No, let the earth come piling over my dead body before I hear your cries, hear you dragged away. That is sublime. And if it does not move you to be at least a little more courageous, I don't know what will. Although we don't all react the same way to great literature and philosophy, you must embrace that there is universal value in greatness. Go out and find your sublime. Go out and find that which will move you in your life, in your soul, in the vision of your potential for greatness. Seek to be great in something. We need greatness. We need constant reminders of the propensity for greatness in the human condition. Become a source of that greatness. Now, if there's a particular speech or poem that you find to be sublime, send me a link to it at theneutralgroundpodcast at gmail.com or even better, go to theneutralgroundpodcast.com and read it as an audio comment as you want it to be heard. I would love to know what you find to be sublime. If you've enjoyed the episode and have not yet hit the subscribe or follow button, please do so. And consider head heading over to my main website, theneutralgroundpodcast.com to learn how you can help support the podcast in numerous ways to help us continue to build a neutral ground community of thinkers. As always, I thank you for listening and try to keep one foot firmly planted on the neutral ground and have a great day.